Greetings, everyone. It is the Sabbath, and it is October 28th, 2023, and uh, the picture you see behind me is the east wall of the Temple Mount, and it's a picture that I took while I was over there uh, two weeks ago, uh, just during the current fighting that's going on. Anyway, um... We're going to talk today about Ezekiel 23 and further on, and there's a lot <laughs> to this story of Ahola and Holaba, and I'll explain as we go through, but really important prophecy because it tells us something very, very important about uh, God and what's going on here. Um, important that we pay attention to this prophecy. So we will start in Ezekiel 23 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed. There they bruised the tits of their virginity. And the names of them were Aholah the elder and Aholah the sister. And they were mine. And they bore sons and daughters, and their names were Samaria, Thus were their names, Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem Aholaba. And Ahola played the harlot <clears throat> when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, and all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, and with all of them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols, she defiled herself. Neither left she her whoredoms, neither left she her whoredoms brought from Egypt, for in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the breasts of her virginity, and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians, upon whom she doted. So we look at what's going on here, and we see that Samaria is the northern tribes. And we see that uh, they were taken into captivity with the Assyrians. And when they came back, they were called Samaritans, Samaritans or Samarians, however you, Samaritans. So when we look at this on the surface, the story is, not, is pretty clear historically. Um, there's no question about how God views us, and it's never complimentary, extremely rarely complimentary. It's almost always about whoredoms and uh, the worst kind of disloyalty. And when you think about that, it's to be expected because we're human and God is God. However, it's so horrifyingly disturbing what happens with God's people and how we rarely, if ever, do what we're supposed to and actually follow God. We're always following after some pagan idol or something. Or after the lust of the flesh or after, you know, whatever's good in one's own sight. This is particularly disturbing to me because it follows along the same lines as Hosea, which, you know, you go over Hosea, and Hosea has a wife that <laughs> cheats on him constantly, just goes out and plays the whore, and he takes her back every single time. And drags her, literally drags her out of these places that are shocking. And when we think about what we would do if our husband or our wife did such things, uh, there are very few people, very, very few people, probably none who would do what Hosea did. 
and there is nobody else that will do what God has done, having watched us be disloyal so many, many billions of times. And this whole circumstance, honestly, is enough to make me kind of wretch because it's disgusting and it's horrifying and it's horrible. And we do it without even thinking every day, every day of our lives. And God's people do not follow him the way they should in any way. And we go after all of these different things, and it's literally horrifying. So, <clears throat> and I'm no different. I'm not saying I am because I'm not. We're all this way. And, you know, all the tables are full of vomit, vomit and there is no place clean. And the reality of this circumstance is we have to change. And it's unfortunate that we're going to have to change in the midst of this horror that's coming upon us. But the reality is, is we won't change unless we're in the midst of this horror that's coming upon us. We don't change unless we're distressed. We don't change unless there's a good reason for change. And the change here is whether we live or whether we die. So know that in this story, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things going on. And when we talk about Ahola and Aholava, there's some really important things going on because we see where God's people are and where God is. And you don't see that by reading this much because God's just disgusted with us. So I'll continue reading here for a bit and I'll stop when I feel like it. But verse nine again, wherefore I have delivered her into the hands of her lovers and the hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. These discovered her nakedness, and they took her sons and her daughters, and slew her with the sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. They despised her so much because of her behavior. And when her sister Aholaba saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, and captains and rulers clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, and that they took both one way, and that she increased her whoredoms. For when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, and exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes, to look to after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her with a bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So she discovered her whoredoms, and had discovered her nakedness, and then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms, and calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their paramours, their loves, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thus you called to remembrance the lewdness of your youth, and the bruising of your tits by the Egyptians, for the paps of your youth. Therefore, O Aholava, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up your lovers against you, from whom my mind is alienated, alienated, and I will bring them against you on every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans and Pekod and Shoah and Koah and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses, and they shall come against you with chariots and wagons and wheels and with an assembly of people, which shall set against you buckler and shield and helmet round about, and I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments." And I will set my jealousy against you, and they shall deal furiously with you. They shall take away your nose and your ears, and your remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take your sons and daughters, and your residue shall be devoured by the fire. You know, this is the same story as everything else we see 
in Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. But when they cut off your nose and your ears, and everybody who's left that's not dead gets dead by the sword, and everybody that's left and even the bones are burned in the fire, it's not good. They shall also strip you out of your clothes and take away your fair jewels. Thus will I make your lewdness cease from you and your whoredom brought from the land of Egypt, so that you shall not lift up your eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. What's the purpose of destroying God's own people? So that we don't remember our idols. So that when God saves us, he's the big one. He's the one who's giant in our vision. And it has to be so. Because we don't do what we're supposed to do when we have something sparkly near us. Ooh, shiny. That's all we think when we're around our idols. And God's got to take our idols away from us so that we don't go, ooh, shiny, off the wrong direction. And it's just the reality of who we are. So don't be surprised when God destroys us for our idolatry. For all the things that say, ooh, shiny, to us. He's going to take all that away. And there's not going to be any of it. Verse 28, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver you into the hand of them whom you hate, into the hand of, whom, of them from whom your mind is alienated. So let's go back for a second and talk about that alienation. <clears throat> When you admire something, when you love something, and you go out and you grasp it, you go out and take it, you go out and involve yourself in it 100%. And then suddenly you realize, oh, this isn't what I expected. This isn't good. You have a change of heart about the thing which you have become involved in. And that's what this alienation is all about. When Israel or Judah or whoever, whomever, got themselves involved in idols so deep, what happened? What happened when they got involved that deep? And the reality is that they gained all of the sorrows of the wicked. All of the sorrows of the wicked. The law did not protect them from a variety of different things. And their sorrows were multiplied. Their children were killed around them. Their children were taken for horrible things. They got to the point where they hated being where they were so much that they wanted to go back towards God. But when they got to that point, God was alienated from them. Why then? Because that's the only logical point at which it would do any good for God to be alienated from his people. If he'd been alienated before, he would have just killed them and said, forget this, I don't want these people anymore. But he waited until the point at which they were frustrated and distressed by their circumstance. And a lot of people, a lot of God's people, are frustrated by their circumstance now. They want out of their circumstance. They want to stop doing all of the things that we've been forced to do in slavery in Babylon. Because that's where we are. Babylon, the fifth Babylon, which is America. And the reality of that circumstance is, when we're ready to get out, God will get us out. But in the process of doing that, he has to break us down and remove the idols. Because we want out, but we don't want to let go of our idols. And as long as our idols are with us, God won't be. 
So we're alienated in our circumstance. We hate the circumstance we're in much, but we're not willing to let go completely. And in fact, we can't. As much as we would like to, we just can't. There's no way to do it. You know, if somebody's independently, extraordinarily independently wealthy, they might be able to go to some country somewhere and live primitively on a farm and not get involved in much of anything. But the reality is, is there's problems with that too. <laughs> Lots of them. Because in the end, you're not in Jerusalem. You're not in the kingdom of God. You can't create the kingdom of God on your own. Even if you did that, you'd still be without God. And that's a problem. We have to get out of this circumstance, and we can't do it ourselves. And God's solution for this problem is perfect. It's just extraordinarily painful. Extraordinarily painful. So expect <clears throat> that God's going to break up the idolatry. Expect that because our minds are alienated from this country and from our circumstance, not just the country, but the, the circumstance that we're in, the slavery that we maintain going to work every day and the slavery that we're that we maintain just by having money it's all a form of slavery and it's something that god wants to release us from but it's not easy to be let loose in this circumstance what does god say about captivity There's a lot of things about captivity. What's the most important thing that God says about captivity? The truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. And it is ever so true in this circumstance. The primary circumstance for which he said it. The truth will set us free. Sometimes it's hard to look the truth in the face. And to deal with this properly and appropriately, we have to look the truth in the face, which means we have to examine ourselves and we have to find what our circumstance is. And when we find what our circumstance is, there is a lot of horror and a lot of sorrow and a lot of fear. Because if you feel good about yourself right now, You're in big trouble because you're part of the blind, leading the blind, or being led by the blind, or whatever circumstance it is, your blindness is almost certain. If you're not scared by current events and by what's going on in the world, your brain's not engaged. And I don't have to worry, honestly, I don't have to worry about insulting people, you know, in this fashion, because almost everybody's terrified right now. Everybody is afraid of what's going to happen in the future, whether it's just China and Russia and what's going on, you know, with oil and money or whatever. But everybody can see the probability, the high probability of chaos in our time. When resources get short, there are wars. And we're in a moment in time in which <laughs> war is imminent. War is imminent. But nobody can quite see how that war is going to start. Very few people can see how it's going to start. I can see how it's going to start. And it's scary, because Babylon has to fall, and the beast has to rise, and there's no other way this can happen. 
Let's continue on in Ezekiel. Verse 28 again. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver you into the hand of them whom you hate, into the hand of whom your mind is alienated. And they shall deal with you hatefully, and shall take away all your labor, and shall leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoredoms shall be discovered, both your lewdness and your whoredoms. This is our shame. This is what's going to happen to this nation and to the people in this nation. Us first, God's people first, within this nation. How do you know that? Begin at my sanctuary. Begin at my sanctuary. I will do these things unto you because you have gone a whoring after the heathen and because you are polluted with their idols. You have walked in the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord God, you shall drink your sister's cup deep and large. You shall be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It contains much. This is what God's going to do, is force feed us. Essentially, the same thing that the Jews discovered in World War II. You shall be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with a cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of your sister Samaria. You shall even drink it and suck it out, and you shall break the sherds thereof, and pluck off your own breasts, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. You can't escape it when God says he's going to do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore bear also you also your lewdness and your whoredoms. My people have forgotten me days without number. Because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, and we have done this over and over and over, and we have done it while declaring we're doing his will. We lie about everything he says to do and said to do and has asked us to do all the way through. And now Christianity is this light thing that has no strength and has no depth of character, has no power. Mainstream Christianity is a joke and everyone laughs. Everyone laughs. Why? Because we're just paying someone to tell us what we want to hear. And the obvious idiocy of what they're telling people is laughable to the whole world. It's just tragically sad. Verse 36. <laughs> Verse 36. The Lord said, Moreover unto me, son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholaba? Yea, declare unto them their abominations. And the answer is yes. We have to know our abominations or we cannot change. And when God destroys us and puts us in these circumstances where we are utterly forsaken of God, we're the ones who have to respond and return to him. And if you don't know you have to, then you won't do it. But when you're told that you have to do this, you will do it in the right circumstance when you've got nothing left. Yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands, and with their idols they have committed adultery, and have also caused their sons whom they bore unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. 
We sacrifice our children. And it's not just abortion. That's a big one. Well, how am I sacrificing my child? I mean, you can you can follow it right through. How am I? I'm just having an abortion. I, I can't have a child right now. I, I'm having an abortion. Well, <laughs> you're sacrificing that child for your own comfort, for your own desires. That's what's happening there. And we do it in other ways, too. It's not just that. We send them off to boarding school or we do all kinds of crazy, stupid things with our children that should not ought to be done in a family. We abuse them horribly sometimes. Does God do this to us? Does God do that to us? And the answer is yes, he does. But only when there's no other choice. Only when there's no other choice, God has got to get his people to follow him. And the only reason he ever harms us is to get us to do what we should do. He always has our best interests at heart, every single time, even when he's angry, even when he destroys us. We're the ones who have done it wrong over and over and over, every single time. And God's done it perfectly and correctly and right every single time, just like Jose. And most people, when they read Hosea, they think, that poor guy, what an idiot. Why would he keep chasing after this woman? I would never do that. They say things like this. And yet if God did not give us the example of Hosea, we wouldn't know what he goes through. Or even this example here. Verse 38, moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbath. For when they had slain their children to their idols, they came. then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus they have done in the midst of my house. God's saying, you've done this in the middle of my house. You go out, destroy your child, and then you come into the church to pray. wonder how many women have actually done that. wonder how many men have done that. You know? Look in the mirror. This is where we're at. Regardless of whether you personally did that, this is where our people are. It's important that you notice what he says about the midst of my house. We're going to get back to that. And furthermore, that you have sent for men to come from afar unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came for whom you did wash yourself, painted your eyes, and decked yourself with ornaments. We've dolled ourselves up and keep acting the whore. And sat upon a stately bed and a table prepared before it, whereupon you have set my incense and my oil. And a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her, and with the men of the common sort were brought Sabians from the wilderness, wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old in adulteries, Will they now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? Yet they went in unto her, as they go in unto a woman that plays the harlot. So they went in unto Ahola and Aholaba, the lewd women. And I honestly don't know what women feel like when they read this, but it probably feels really grungy and scummy. It makes me feel that way. It's horrible. And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses, 
and after the manner of women that shed blood, because they are adulteresses, and blood is in their hands. Our hands. We're responsible for this. We did this over and over and over, from Egypt until now. In Babylon. The fifth Babylon. Five Babylons we've been doing this. For thus says the Lord God, it will bring up a company upon them and will give them to be removed and spoiled. Removed and spoiled. Slaves without anything in a foreign country. And the company shall stone them with stones and dispatch them with their swords. And they shall slay their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses with fire. This is what we have chosen as a people over and over and over again. And God's going to give it to us in the end time, in the day of the Lord, in spades. The punishment for all ages comes upon us in the end time. And if you say that's not fair, doesn't appear fair from our perspective, but it's fair. And it's necessary for God to bring his people through the fire. And we have to be brought through the fire. We have to come through the valley of the shadow of death. We have to walk through it. We have no choice. There is no choice. America's going to die. And that's all there is to it. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Do we want that? Do we choose that? <laughs> no, because it's horrifying and horrible and terrifying and terrible. And it is evil and there is no light in it. something that must be endured and can only be endured with God. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense your lewdness upon you and you shall bear the sins of your idols and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. We will bear the sins of our idols. And most people don't get their own idols. They just don't see them. They just don't understand them. But when you understand that God says that we're going to bear the sins of our idols, and that means that America is going to be destroyed completely, and we're going to go, most of us, into slavery in all the nations of the world, then know that there are some things that you need to discover about your idolatry. <clears throat> so when we go back up, we'll talk about a few things here. The key to this whole scripture the key to this whole scripture, this whole chapter, is in the names Ahola and Aholaba. It's absolutely critically important that you understand <laughs> what these names mean. So I'm going to read through from. Uh, looks like Wikipedia. Um, there's a pun in these names in the Hebrew. Ahola means her tent, and Aholava means my tent is in her. <laughs> and it may not be immediately obvious, but it is important because the tabernacle of God, his house, 
is with a holava and not with a hola. And if you want to look around for a hola, you can find them in Judea, in the Israel of God, in the nation over there in the Middle East. That's a hola. And you can argue about, oh, well, the northern tribes went. The reality is, is that's who they are. And you want to talk about the Samaritans and, oh, they were with the Assyrians and, you know, Judah hated them when they came back. And, yeah, okay, whatever. The reality is there's not a single Jew in this world right now. Well, maybe not a single one. There are almost no Jews in this world right now who know who they are. There are no Jews in this world who can prove who they are. And they've all been scattered in the midst of the nations. And they've all done exactly what happened to, Assyria, to the northern tribes who went into Assyria. That's the circumstance. That's the reality of it. And where's Aholaba? Aholaba, Jerusalem, <laughs> is in the midst of America. There's no doubt about that. There's no question about that. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures again, but there's no doubt about that. And what's important is that God's tent is in her. God's tabernacle, God's house is in her. As polluted as she is, that's where God's house is. Why? It should be obvious. It should be very obvious. We know who our Messiah is. We know who he is. We've read the Gospels. We know what's going on in the New Testament. And hola. No. It's her tent now. Once that curtain... <laughs> was rent. Once the temple was destroyed, God's house was removed. And he put it somewhere else. This is a very live prophecy. And it's really important to us because we're in the midst of it. Verse 38, moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. Let's go on to Ezekiel 24. I don't have anything more to say about that right now. So let's read Ezekiel 24, verse 1. And again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, write you the name of the day, even of this same day, the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem this same day. And utter a parable unto the rebellious house, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Set on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. So we have the... <laughs> <laughs> famous metaphor of a pot of water set on the fire to boil. Hmm. Gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice bone. So we're making a stew. Take the choice of the flock and burn also the bones under it and make it boil well, and then let them boil the bones of it therein. Wherefore, thus says the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, <clears throat> whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece and let no lot fall upon it. Nothing escapes. 
Nothing gets lucky and draws. We don't have a good metaphor in English. Say the, sh the short <laughs> straw, but that's usually the loser. <laughs> For her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come upon to t upon come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. So what happens when you don't cover blood? It's in evidence. What happened to get the blood? Some sin, some crime was committed to get the blood. When somebody points the blood out and makes it extraordinarily obvious, then the sin is going to be punished. Whatever the problem is, it's going to come around. And it will not be covered. It will not be protected. It will not be in any way relieved from the responsibility of that blood. that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock that it should not be covered. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, woe to the bloody city. I will even make the pile for fire great. What's the bloody city? Jerusalem. Look it up. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Then set it upon, set it empty upon the coals thereof, that the brass of it may be hot and may burn, and that the filthiness of it may be molten in that in it, that the scum of it may be consumed. God's willing to destroy it all to get rid of the scum. He's willing to destroy it all to get rid of the scum. He doesn't want cockroaches in his kingdom. The scum's got to go. And yet we will remain if we do what we're supposed to do. Yet not one grain shall fall to the earth. God's not willing to let one of his good ones fall to the earth. But the scum's got to go. She has wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire. God's going to destroy the scum. In your filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged you, and you were not purged. You shall not be purged from your filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. This is a prophetic statement. You shall not be purged from your filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. Don't care what you do. You will not be purged of your sin until God has caused his fury to rest upon us. That's a promise. As much as you might like to try and get clean, you won't succeed. And that seems pretty harsh, almost unfair, but it's not unfair. We've gotten ourselves in this deep. We've gotten ourselves in so deep that we can't get out no matter what we try. So God's got to do it for us. And it's not going to be without pain. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to your ways and according to your doings, shall they judge you, says the Lord God. That's a harsh, harsh scripture. But the truth of it is important. Because we have to face this. We have to look it in the eye and bow our heads 
and apologize, actually repent of our sin and let God deal with it and destroy all of our idols. We have to be willing to let our idols go, whether they're our kids or our grandparents or our business or our car or our house or our computer or whatever it is that we have that are, that are idols. The ideas that we have in our head about things. The paganism that we're involved in. The music groups, the TV shows. All the stuff that you can't actually point at as a physical thing. Because we have lots of idols that are not physical things. I'm going to read verse 14 again. I, the Lord, have spoken it. No, I'm going to read 13 and 14. In your filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged you and you were not purged. You shall not be purged from your filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare, neither will I repent. According to your ways and according to your doings, shall they judge you, says the Lord God. They being the beast. Also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shall you mourn nor weep, neither shall your tears run down. God killed Ezekiel's wife. Dead. Boom. And said, no, you're not going to weep. And you're going to shed no tears. Forbear to cry. Don't cry. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of your head upon you, and put on the, your shoes on your feet, and cover not your lips, and eat not the bread of men. This is a prophecy. And it's going to come to us. You say, well, how is this going to come to us? There's going to come a point here very soon when it's not possible to mourn the dead. And there are many things in Jeremiah that describe it in depth, clearly. But the reality is, the people around us who die are just going to lie there dead, and we're going to have to move on. Shell-shocked. Super P PTSD. We're going to have to move on. We're going to have to walk away from the dead. while they dry up and the crows eat their eyes out. This is how it's going to be. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of your head upon you, your hat, and put your shoes on your feet and cover not your lips and eat not the bread of men. So I spoke unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Wow. And the people said unto me, Will you not tell us what these things are to us? And that, that you do this in this manner? And I answered them, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pities, and your sons and your daughters whom you, sh you have left shall fall by the sword. So this happened before, don't get me wrong. This is a historic event. <laughs> but that should just tell us how important this last iteration is. Because our sons and our daughters whom you have left, whom we have left, shall die by the sword. Lots of them, not all of them. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat 
of the bread of men, and your hat shall be upon your heads and your shoes upon your feet. You shall not mourn nor weep, but you shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one toward another. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign according to all that he has done, so shall you do. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. When it comes, we'll know who God is. Because he's not just a pushover, like modern Christianity has said. Also, you son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their hair, their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereupon they set their minds and their sons and their daughters? America is still the most powerful nation in the world, and we're proud of that. And it's going to be taken from us. And we're going to become the least in the world. That he that escapes in that day shall come unto you to cause you to hear it with your ears. Question mark. To cause it to hear it, cause you to hear it with your ears? <laughs> in that day shall your mouth be open to him which is escaped, and you shall speak and be no more dumb, and you shall be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And there's all kinds of things in there, too. One of the two witnesses will be amongst us. And the reality is he's not going to always be able to speak. And he will not always answer questions. And that he will not always say the things that people want him to say. Because God's going to shut up his mouth at certain times. For certain reasons. Because people have to make their own choices. And they have to choose whether they live or whether they die. Ezekiel 25. So I'll read through this, but the reality is, is that at this time I'm not really focused upon what happens with the Gentiles. So there are things that are important about this, but... Uh, I'll read it. We'll see what comes out. Verse twenty, uh, Chapter 25, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. And the Ammonites are around today. And say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Because you cheered and said, yes, when all these things happened. Behold, therefore, I will deliver you to the men of the east for a possession, and they shall set their palaces in you and make their dwellings in you. They shall eat your fruit and shall drink your milk. And I will make Rabbah a stable for camels and the Ammonites a couching place for flocks. And you shall know that I am the Lord, a resting place for flocks. And you shall know that I am the Lord. God says he's going to do a lot of different things with a lot of different people. The Ammonites are not going to get the best end of the deal. Verse 6, For thus says the Lord God, because you have clapped your hands and stamped with your feet and rejoiced in heart with all your despite against the land of Israel, behold, behold therefore I will stretch out my hand upon you and will deliver you for a spoil to the heathen, and I will cut you off from the people, and I will cause you to perish out of the countries. I will destroy you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Moab. So, when we're talking about these people, we're talking mostly about the Jordanians and maybe some of the Saudis and, you know, people in this area. The Syrians, Lebanese, not saying they're all them, but these people that are around, directly around Israel, are most of these. And there's some 
that are elsewhere as well. But to Moab, verse 8, thus says the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities and from his cities, which are on his frontiers, the glory of the country, Beth Jeshemoth and Baal Meon and Kiriathame, unto the men of the east with the Ammonites, and will give them in possession that the Ammonites may not be remembered among the nations. And I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Ammonites and Moab. This is mostly Jordan. Edom. Thus says the Lord God, because that Edom has dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and has greatly offended, and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dadan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger, and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. And this is one of those circumstances in which God is going to cause his own people to destroy a nation. And this is likely just after the beginning of the kingdom of God begins. Um, and there are other places where it talks about this. This is not in isolation. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. So when it says, you know, the least of them shall be as David and <laughs> the greatest of them shall be as God, this is what it's talking about, among other things. The Philistines, the Palestinians, thus says the Lord God, because the Palestinians have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand upon the Palestinians and I will cut off the Cherethims and destroy the remnant of the sea coast, Gaza. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Twenty-six. Ah, Tyre. Hmm. Tyre is a little bit of a tough one. Tyre is a little bit of a tough one. Tyre is, in my opinion, most likely in Babylon now. So, that's my opinion. Stated clearly as my opinion, not as a truth. The reality is, is that in all likelihood, Tyre is in Babylon. And the reason is that they behave very much the same way. And there is no one who prophetically stands out in the Middle East in this manner. So, you know, we can say this or that or the other thing. There's lots of things that can be said about all this. But my opinion, as I said, is that Tyre is in the midst of Babylon. And it came to me to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, because that Tyrus has said against Jerusalem, Aha! Yay! She is broken. That was the gate of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against you, as the sea causes his waves to come up. And this is one of the reasons why I think Tyre is in Babylon in this time. Uh, because the ocean are all the peoples of the world. And the destruction of Tyre is almost precisely exactly the same as the descriptions of the punishment of Babylon. So, take it for how you will. Verse 4, And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, says the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. All the nations. And her daughters, which are in the field, shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. 
and he shall slay with the sword your daughters in the field, and he shall make a fort against you, and cast a mount against you, and lift up the buckler against you. And he shall set engines of war against your walls, and with his axes he shall break down your towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses shall their dust cover you. Your walls shall shake with the noise of the horsemen, and the wheels, and of the chariots, when he shall enter into the gates, as the men enter into a city wherein is made a breach. Which is a pretty rough <laughs> thing to happen to a city. With the hooves of his horses shall he tread down all your streets, and he shall slay the people, your people, by the sword, and with strong garrison, your, your strong garrison shall go down to the ground. And they shall make a spoil of your riches, and make a prey of your merchandise, and they shall break down your walls, and destroy your pleasant houses, and they shall lay your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of your songs to cease, and the sound of your harp shall no more be heard. And I will make you like the top of a rock. You shall be a a place to spread nets upon. You shall be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken it, says the Lord God. And thus says the Lord God to Tyrus, shall not the isle shake at the sound of your fall, when you, the wounded cry, when the slaughter is made in the midst of you? And then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at you. The descriptions for Tyre are long, relatively long, and in-depth. And frankly, I don't think they're just referring to ancient Tyre. Don't. It's too much. Verse 17, And they shall take up a lamentation for you and say to you, how are you destroyed that was inhabited of seafaring men, the renowned city which was strong in the sea, she and her inhabitants, which caused their terror to be upon all that haunt it? That description is hard. Is hard to get away from when you look at the ocean today and who has the strongest ships in the sea. <laughs> Now shall the isles tremble in the day of your fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled for your, at your departure. For thus says the Lord God, when I shall make you a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon you, and great waters shall cover you, when I shall bring you down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time, again, with the people of old time, and shall set you in the in the low parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down to the pit, that you be not inhabited. I shall set glory in the land of the living. I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, yet shall you never be never be found again, says the Lord God. So another clue there is, I shall set glory in the land of the living. When does God do that? When does God set glory in the land of the living? at the beginning of his kingdom. So, quite certain that Tyre is, again, a part of America currently. Okay, let's maybe finish. No, no, we still got time. We're good. Let's keep going. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now you son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus. And say unto Tyrus, O you that are situated at the entry of the sea, which are a merchant of the, of the people for many islands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyrus, you have said, I am of perfect beauty. And this parallels Babylon, the descriptions of Babylon, so clearly. Your borders are in the midst of the seas. Again, the midst of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They have made all your ships boards of fir trees from Senir. They have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for you. And of the oaks of Bashan have they made your oars. The company of the Asherites have made your benches of ivory brought out of the isles of Kittim. So when you read these descriptions, you know, whether it's here or Revelation 17 and 18 or wherever, it's talking about something that was built or made with the finest things. And... Tyre, both historically and, you know, in these scriptures, uh, was described that way, just as Babylon was. 
Verse 7, fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which you spread forth to be to, to be your sail, Pur uh, blue and purple from the isles of Elisha, that was that which covered you. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were your mariners, your wise men, O Tyrus, that were in you were your pilots. The ancients of Gebal and the wise men thereof were, were in you your caulkers, or the people who fixed the, the ships. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to occupy your merchandise. They of Persian, of Lud, and of Phut were in your army. Your men of war, they hanged the shield and helmet in you, and they set forth their com your comeliness. The men of Arvad with your army were upon your walls round about, and the Gamadims were in your towers. They hanged their shields upon your walls round about, and they have made your beauty perfect. So again, we're talking about a melting pot you know, a variety of different people in this country. Tarshish was your merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches. With silver and iron, tin and lead, they traded in your affairs. Javan and Tubal and Meshach, they were your merchants. They traded in the persons of men and vessels of brass in your market. And they of the house of Tagarma traded in your affairs with horses and horsemen and mules. And they of Dadan, the men of Dadan, were your merchants. Many isles were the merchandise of your hand. And they brought you for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Syria was your merchant by reason of the multitude of the wares of your making, and they occupied in your affairs with emeralds and purple and broidered work and fine linen and coral and agate. So again, we're describing all of the richest things in that time, which typically, if you look at the precedents in the Bible, uh, are a discussion of all the finest things that we can manufacture today. And Tyre, um, I don't remember, I don't remember any people being uh, predominant in Tyre in the Bible. I don't know. There were a lot of different people. I'd have to look it up. I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. It's just one of those things where there it was a melting pot of a lot of different people. Uh, verse 17, Judah and the land of Israel, they were your merchants. They traded in your market wheat of Minneth and Panag and honey and oil and balm. Damascus was your merchant in the multitude of the wares of your making for the multitude of all riches and the wine of Helbon and white wool. Dan also and Javan going to and fro occupied your fairs. Bright iron, cassia, and calamus were in your market. Dadan was your merchant in precious clothes for chariots. And Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with you in lambs and in rams and in goats. And these were your merchants. Were they your merchants? The merchants of Sheba and Rama, they were your merchants. They occupied in your fairs with chief of all spices and all with all precious stones and gold. And Haran and Kenna and Eden and the merchants of Sheba, Asher and Kilmod were your merchants. They were your merchants in all sorts of things, in blue clothes, embroidered work, and the chests of rich apparel, bound with cords made of cedar among your mer merchandise. And the ships of Tarshish did sing with you in your market, and you were replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Your rowers have brought you into the great waters. The east wind has broken you in the midst of the seas. Your riches and your fares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers and the appoint uh, occupiers of your merchandise, and all your men of war that are in you and in all your company which is in the midst of you shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of your ruin. The suburbs shall shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots. And all that handle the oar... The, mar the mariners and all the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships, and they shall stand upon the land, and shall cause their voice to be heard against you, and shall cry bitterly, and shall cast up dust upon their heads, and they shall wallow themselves in the ashes. And they shall make themselves utterly bald for you, and gird them with sackcloth, and they shall weep for you with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. And when you look at this, we're talking about all of the people who are involved in merchanting, especially in the ocean. They're all going to be sad. It doesn't say they're all dead, but Tyre's dead. So, like I suspect, like I said, I suspect this is a great part of Babylon, and you can see the same mourning in Revelation 18. 
And in their wailing, they shall take up a lamentation for you, in verse 32, and lament over you, saying, What city is like unto Tyrus, that destroy, that, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? <laughs> what city is like unto great Babylon? <laughs> when your wares went forth out of, this, out of the seas, you filled many people, and you did enrich the kings of the earth with the multitude of your riches and your merchandise, which is the same exact thing that's spoken of Babylon in Revelation 18. In the time when you shall be broken by the seas, in the depths of the waters, your merchandise and all your company in the midst of you shall fall. And all the inhabitants of the isles shall be astonished at you, and their kings shall be sore afraid, they shall be troubled in their countenance. The merchants among the people shall hiss at you, you shall be a terror, and sh never shall be any more. So, another whole chapter devoted to the destruction of a merchant nation without any particular prophetic thing except you're going to get destroyed and here's all this massive amount of merchandise. Why did God record that in such a fashion? Um, you've already heard my opinion. Uh, Ezekiel 28. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man, and not God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from you. Hmm. Hmm. With your wisdom and with your understanding, you have gotten you riches and have gotten gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and by your traffic or by your, your business, have you increased your riches and your heart is lifted up by your riches, because of your riches. And therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of God, before, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon you, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and they shall defile your brightness. They shall bring you down to the pit. <laughs> Excuse me. And you shall die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Will you yet say before him that slays you, I am God? But you shall be a man and no God in the hand of him that slays you. <laughs> and again, this whole pride thing and this whole you know, owning of the oceans and riches and all this kind of thing. And it, it overlaps, in my opinion, unquestionably with Babylon. But it's still my opinion. <sighs> you shall die the deaths of the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised by the hands of, a, of strangers, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. Well, that's an odd statement, isn't it? Really odd statement in isolation. You shall die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. Sounds like the Prince of Tyre is an Israelite to me. What it sounds like to me. Who knows? Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius and the topaz, and the diamond and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. The workmanship of your tabrets and your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers... And I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Huh. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. And you have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Yeah. Pretty hard to get away from the fact that this is most likely someone who is in Babylon now. And when you look at the Holy Mountain of God, which is his own people, 
even though it's scary right now, and that someone is walking up and down on it, kind of makes sense. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. And by the multitude of your merchandise have they filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of meaning in this. And I'm not going to go into a depth in a bunch of it, because... Frankly, I don't think we're ready for that. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness, and I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities and by the iniquity of your traffic or your business, your merchanting. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of you, and it shall devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. And all they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You shall be a terror, and never shall you be any more. And then we come to Zidon. Zidon. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Zidon, and prophesy against it. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Zidon. And in history, Zidon was a city that was very near Tyre. And I will be glorified in the midst of you, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall have executed judgments in her, and shall be sanctified in her. For I will send into her pestilence, and blood into her streets, and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and there shall be no more a pricking briar under the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them, that despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord God. So this is a people that are very, very close to Israel now. And if I had to guess, I'd say maybe some of the people that are in Lebanon. Probably. Ezekiel 28, verse 25, Thus says the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. Okay. <clears throat> so, again, this is a big one that puts everything together, and it establishes a timeline. And there's some really important things in here. Thus says the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered. So the house of Israel is scattered. And when you look at the end time and in the context of the destruction, which is what we're all talking about all the way through here, this is the second end exodus. So this is the time after the 42 months uh, of being trodden underfoot by the beast and God regathers the houses of Israel from the people among who they're scattered. So they're scattered to the four corners of the, of, the, of the world, and God hunts and fishes for them and brings them back at that time. So when God does that, and this is Israel, it doesn't say Jerusalem, this is Israel, though there are, will be those of Jerusalem with them, uh, they shall be sanct and... Hmm. Let me read it again. Thus says Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from people, the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen. So, the sentence structure is a little awkward, but when God is sanctified in them, in front of everybody, when the kingdom begins, that's when this is talking about. Then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. Why Jacob? Because Judah and Israel are then back together. And Israel as a whole, God calls Jacob. Because it's obvious that Jacob, Israel, and Judah are one. It's <laughs> one of the beautiful things that God has done. And they shall dwell safely therein, and they shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Yay! 
So the judgments, executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about, that was Tyre and Sidon and and Moab and Ammon and etc. Everybody we just went through. God's going to kill all those people, or a lot of them. I'm starting to lose my focus here for some reason. There. Oh, I need to move my camera. I think I must have moved it or something. All right, guys. Yep. All right, came into focus. All right. Um. So yeah, this is God's reestablishing the timeline, and He's reestablishing uh, the circumstances of what's going on here. So uh, this little section of these two verses is just to reestablish what we're talking about and why God's talking about all of these, you know heathen countries and pagan nations that are uh, at issue. And let's go to chapter 29. And so we're not at 2 o'clock yet, so we're still doing pretty well on time. Um, Ezekiel 29, verse 1. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, which has said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks into your jaws, and I will cause the fish of your rivers to stick under your scales, and I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, and all the fish of your rivers shall stick under your scales. And I will leave you thrown into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You shall fall upon the open fields, and you shall not be brought together nor gathered. I have given you for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of heaven. And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. A staff of reed to the house of Israel. You get what that means, right? When you have a staff and you go walking and you go walking across country and everything, you want a nice sturdy stick that will hold up when you walk along and climb a hill and, you know, and when your foot slips and you can hold on to your stick and whatnot. But a reed <laughs> kind of bends and breaks. Mm. It's not strong enough for the purpose. And neither is Egypt to Israel or to the people of God in the end time. And there are many things in Isaiah that are written about Egypt. And there are many things in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah that are also written about Egypt. And the reality is, is that Egypt cannot help us. And... Again, I'll say something highly controversial, but the reality of it is that Egypt is probably Great Britain. And I know that seems like a giant stretch to anybody, but uh, all of the descriptions of what I see, you know, they will fall upon Egypt, the nation today as well. But um, I'm fairly certain that many of the people who were the rulers of Egypt, actually ended up in Great Britain, oddly. Um, you know, there are a variety of reasons I say that, and the easy ones are, if you want to learn about Egypt, where do you go? And the answer is, well, to Egypt, of course, but also the British Museum <laughs> has more than anybody else in the world, and there's a lot of mysticism and a lot of... Uh, a lot of things in Great Britain that go back to Egypt. Um, there's a lot of reasons that I think that. And if you think, oh, well, that's odd. Babylon's the same thing. Babylon's the same thing. You know, Babylon being America is odd. It's weird. It's actually much more believable because you can follow all five Babylons through time and it seems easier to see. With Great Britain, it's a little harder. But prophetically, I think Great Britain is the most likely the nation we call Egypt in the Bible. Again, opinion, and you can take that how you will. 
Uh, verse 5 again, and I will leave you thrown into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You shall fall upon the open fields. You shall not be brought together nor gathered. I have given you for meat to the beasts of the field and to the fowls of heaven, and all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. In other words, not much help. Tried, but not much help. And when they took hold of you by their hand, you did break and rend all their shoulder. And when they leaned upon you, you broke and made all their loins to be at stand. <laughs> Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will bring a sword upon you and cut off man and beast out of you. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he has said, the river is mine, and I have made it. It's God. And if you can imagine God's people in Babylon leaning upon the Egypt of the Middle East, you're better at imagining things than me because I can't imagine that for anything. Why ever would somebody from America lean on Egypt as a savior in any form? It doesn't make any sense. So take it for what it is. Verse 10, Behold, therefore, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from the Tower of Syene, even of the borders of Ethiopia. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it, neither shall it be inhabited forty years. <laughs> and why forty years? Well, <laughs> think back to the Israelites. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. So... When God says all these things, he means them, and they will happen the way he says. The thing is that all of this stuff still happens. In the end, when the kingdom comes, there are still the Egyptians and the Israelites and the Assyrians. Those are the three big kingdoms in God's kingdom. So, not the rulers or anything, but they're the three large countries. So when God says all this, you know, there's still going to be these people and they're scattered among the nations in form kind of like the Israelites, but the timing of all this stuff is what's different. So you got to look at it and look at it and look at it. And there's a lot of things... <laughs> There's a lot of things that's going that are going on. Verse 13, yet, yet thus says the Lord God, at the end of the 40 years, I will gather the Egyptians from the people where they were scattered, and I will bring them again, bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation, there, and they shall be there, a base kingdom. So regardless of everything that happens to the Egyptians and Britons, if you want to say, if you can manage to say that without <laughs> a smile, um, will return to their own land in Egypt along the Nile and be a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of kingdoms, of the kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them that they shall no more rule over the nations. And yet they will be a large nation within God's kingdom, even though they rule no one. It shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel, which brings their iniquity to remembrance, when they shall look after them, but they shall know that I am the Lord God. So, whatever nation Egypt is in this end time, know that it can't bring confidence to the house of Israel. And Egypt, as it is in this time, would never, ever, no, no, nobody of God's people would ever have confidence in the nation which is called Egypt today on the Nile. 
And it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth day, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army, army to serve a great service against Tyrus. And every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled, yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he served against it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. For I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, they worked for me, says the Lord God. In that day will I cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth, and I will give you the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will give you the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. Hmm. When has the house of Israel budded forth? <laughs> Not recently. Not recently. Even in that time, not then, I will give you the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. What does that mean? The opening of the mouth. Hmm. I'm reluctant to say anything about that, actually, at this moment. <sighs> The reality is that probably means that, you know, when God says the law shall go forth from Jerusalem, from Zion, Mount Zion, when someone is given the opportunity to open their mouth, to speak, and everyone hears, that's what I read this to be. So I have not actually studied this out or thought about it a great deal, but that is my first instinct when I read this. It could be wrong. I haven't thought about it much, and I have not looked for precedents in the Bible. I think we have time to do chapter 30. So, again, we're talking about Egypt here. And the word of the Lord came unto me again, unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Howl you, woe worth the day. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. So we're given a specific anchor for the day of the Lord. And we're also given a little bit of an anchor in that is, it shall be the time of the heathen. So this is the time of the day of the Lord against the heathen, against the pagans, not against God's own people. So this is after the destruction of Babylon. And uh, there are things going on here. So verse four, and the sword shall come upon Egypt and great pain shall be in Ethiopia when the slain shall fall in Egypt and they shall take away her multitude and her foundation shall be broken down. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people and of Chub and the men of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. So when God begins his kingdom, there's a lot going on. He makes it safe right in that spot around Jerusalem. Uh, he makes his own land safe. But then he stretches out his hand upon the heathen of every country all round about. And I mean the whole world. He should rebuke nations afar off. And this is at the same time that he's bringing his own people back into you know, the glory of Israel and raising them up as the, as the tallest nation in the world. So know that the two witnesses are going to be busy uh, in their ways, and probably the first of the two witnesses is going to be dealing with a lot of this stuff, just like Jeremiah. And the second of the two witnesses is most likely going to be occupied with the internal things of the kingdom. And with being the prince... And, you know, the Messiah is going to be up in the sky above us, 
uh, with the cloud and with the pillar of fire by night. And all of this stuff is going to be happening. So in all likelihood, you know, the second of the two witnesses will be starting to build the, the, the temple. And the first will probably be off rebuke, na rebuking nations afar off. And, you know, that's how I see it based upon what I have read and what I know of what's happening. I'm not saying that's guaranteed or that's the way it's going to be, absolutely. But everything that I read tells me that this is most likely how it will be. Um, so in the context of that, of that, this is what's happening with all these other nations, and particularly we're reading about Egypt. So <clears throat> verse eight, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I have set fire, set a fire in Egypt and when all her helpers shall be destroyed. In that day shall messengers go from for, forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid and great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt for lo, it comes. What comes? The day of the Lord to these people. Thus says the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Well, so here's where we run into this situation where history and the reality of the end time don't always match up. And this is historical, what it's saying right here. And... In this time, Babylon's destroyed in the end time. So unless there's something that I'm really big, giantly mistaken about, um, there are circumstances here where the historical and the future don't match up. And I said this last time, but I would have said it too early. Um, believe what you will. I'm not going to state it categorically in any way, shape, or form that um, it can't be Babylon, but Babylon's dead by the time God's kingdom arises. So it is what it is. Verse 11, he and his people with him and the terrible of the nation shall be brought to destroy the land. And they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked. And I shall make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy idols, the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph. And there shall be no more prince in the land of Egypt. And I will put, put fear in the land of Egypt. So I will cause their images to cease out of Noph. What does everybody see when they think of Egypt? <laughs> They see pyramids and they see all these pictures of Noph and Topanes and all the different things. And this hasn't occurred yet. So unless something happens here dramatically before the destruction of Babylon, which is possible, I can't really see America destroying Egypt at this time. It's hard to, hard to imagine a circumstance where America just attacked Egypt all of a sudden. It's possible, possible, but I'm having a hard time picturing it. I'm having a hard time picturing it. Verse 14, I will make Pathros desolate and will set fire in Zoan and will execute judgments in No. And I will pour my fury upon Sin, the strength of Egypt, and I will cut off the multitude of No. And I will set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain, and No shall be rent asunder, and Noph shall have distresses daily. And the young men of Avon and of Pebeseth shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. At Toponies, also the day shall be darkened when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt and the pump of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her and her daughters shall go into captivity. Thus will I execute judgments in Egypt and they shall know that I am the Lord. So victory for Babylon. And again, this is, in my opinion, historic. unless there's something really big that happens here very shortly. 
And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The Son of Man, I have broken the arm of the Pharaoh, of king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound to be healed, but put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong and that which was broken, and I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. But I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with groanings of a deadly wounded man. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon. And he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. I really think this is just a historic statement, this one. I could be wrong. Um, but everything I see tells me that, in all likelihood, Britain is the Egyptians of the end time, and this does not jibe with that, which means either my theory is wrong, or... Uh, there's something else going on. Put a big question mark by it, honestly. It'll be clear at some point. And we can probably make it through one more chapter. Chapter 31, verse 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh day, in the third month, and the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his multitude, whom are like you in your greatness. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon, with fair branches, and with a shadowy shroud of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great, and the deep set him up on high, with her rivers running around about his plants, and sent, sent out her little rivers under the trees, all the trees of the field. There his, for his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. And all the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness, and the length of his branch, branches, for his root was by great waters. And the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him, the fir trees were not like to his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like to his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Therefore thus says the Lord God, because you have lifted up yourself in height, and you have shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And the strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and in all the valleys. His branches are fallen and his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among their thick boughs the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. Thus says the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them to that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm, that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heaven, of the heathen, sorry, to whom are you thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet you shall be brought down with the trees of Eden under the nether parts of the earth. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. Egypt, the rulers of Egypt, aren't going to survive this. Period. And we're going through these really fast, which is 
kind of what I expected because this isn't where we're at right now. This isn't what we should be focusing on. It's we're going through Ezekiel though, so we're going to go through Ezekiel. Uh, chapter 32 and verse 1, And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up the lamentation for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and say unto him, You are like a young lion of the nations, and you were as a whale in the seas, and you came forth with your rivers, and troubled the waters with your feet, and fouled their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread out my net over you with a company of many people, and they shall bring you up in my net. Then will I leave you upon the land, I will cast forth, cast you forth upon an open field, and will cause all the fowls of heaven to remain upon you, and I will fill the beasts of the whole earth with you. Which is almost exactly what he said before. And I will lay your flesh upon the mountains, and fill the valleys with your height, and I will also water with your blood the land wherein you swim, even to the mountains, and the rivers shall be full of you. And when I shall put you out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark, and I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. And all the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over you and set darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. So we're kicking back to visions of the ten plagues and also forward to the you know things that happen in Revelation. It is what it is. I will also vex the hearts of many people when I shall bring your destruction among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Yea, I will make many people amazed at you, and their kings shall be horribly afraid for you when I shall brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble at every moment, every man for his own life in the day of your fall. So the imagery here is rather extraordinary because... Uh, just start over there. Uh, yeah, I will make many people amazed at you, and their kings shall be horribly afraid for you when I shall brand, brandish my sword before them. So you actually have this image of God brandishing his sword before a bunch of other nations in the process of killing Egypt. Um, pretty rough. Pretty rough. But it also kind of follows along with my opinion of what goes on with Egypt. Because if you look for, if you look out there in the world, anywhere, everywhere, for a, an obvious ruler of a nation, or an obvious uh, monarchy, if you will, the most obvious, <laughs> clear rulership of any land that we have in the world is that of Great Britain and of the current king. So, eh, whatever it's worth. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. By the swords of the mighty will I cause your multitude to fall. And like I said, there's a lot going on here and I don't understand all this. By the words of the mighty will I cause your multitude to fall, and the terrible of the nations, all of them, and they shall spoil the pomp of Egypt, and all the multitude thereof shall be destroyed. I will destroy also the beasts thereof from beside the great waters, neither shall the foot of men trouble them any more, nor the hooves of beasts, beasts trouble them. Then I will make their waters deep, and cause the rivers to run like oil, says the Lord God, when I shall make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country shall be destitute of that wherewith it was full, when I shall smite all them that dwell therein, then shall they know that I am the Lord. This is the lamentation wherewith they shall lam lament her. The daughters of the nation shall lament her. They shall lament for her, even for Egypt and for all her multitude, says the Lord God. And it came to pass also in the twelfth year, in the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her and the daughters of the famous nations under the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. Whom do you pass in beauty? Go down and be you laid with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Asher is there and all her company. His graves are about him, all of the slain fallen by the sword. 
whose graves are set in the sides of the pit, and her company is round about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam and her, all her multitude round about her, around about her grave. All of them slain, fallen by the sword, which are gone down uncircumcised into the nether parts of the earth, which caused their terror in the land of the living. Yet have they borne their shame with them that go down to the pit. They have set her a bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude, her graves around about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet have they borne their shame with them that go down into the pit. He is put in the midst of them that be slain. So we got to stop for a minute and talk about this, you know, slain, uncircumcised, in the pit. When God says you go down into the pit, you go down into the pit. That's it. This is the bottomless pit. This is this is death. And not just death for the first time, but death eternal. So when you're talking about all this, you're talking about all these people who were were pagan heathens that caused their terror in the land of the living and are now dead and dead. So know that this is a serious thing, and yet God still is describing it in this strange way. And when he talks about Babylon, Babylon doesn't even get any of the any of the respect that these people get. So this is an ugly, ugly circumstance. And Personally, I don't want to be a pagan that causes terror in the land of the living. Verse 26, there's Meshach and Tubal and all her multitude, her graves round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with the weapons of war and have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yea, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised, and shall lie with them that are slain by the sword. There is Edom, her kings, and all her princes, which with, which with their might are laid by them that were slain by the sword. They shall, lie down with the they shall lie with the uncircumcised, and with them that go down to the pit. There be the princes of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians which are gone down with the slain, with their terror they are ashamed of their might, and they lie uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword, and bear their shame with them that go down into the pit. Pharaoh shall see them, and shall be comforted over all his multitude, even Pharaoh and all his army, slain by the sword, says the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the, in the land of the living, and he shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword, even Pharaoh and all of his multitude, says the Lord God. A lot of discussion of the pit. So we're going to stop there because we're not starting into Ezekiel 33 on that note. <laughs> so we're going to stop now and see you next time.